first of all, I would like to say thank you all for coming. Um, it's always wonderful to ask back to these conferences and to talk to you guys. So, um, before we start, I would like to take a minute to just listen to somebody playing Horizon Zero Dawn and see if you can spot some frustration in his face. There's a band again. Let's just climb up here. But anyway, so what I'm trying to say, she can't like climb over things. She can't like. She needs handholds to grab things, and it's just like. And whenever you attack an enemy in this game with like R1 or R2, you don't even have to be facing it. You can just press R2, and it'll just slide you right to the nearest enemy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And when an enemy comes running at you, it does like this jumping, toppling. It's just, it repeats the same exact thing over and over and over and over and over again. And it's just like, you can make, they can make enemies not respond and I'd still have more than enough. I'd still get bored of the game. Within killing the first 10 enemies, I already was bored of the game because they all do the same animations. Like there's no way this is a triple A game. Like this is just ridiculous. He's not really wrong here. I mean, you can hear him saying that climbing was very limited, uh, that melee doesn't really work, and that enemies were lacking some depth, right? And as well received as Zero Dawn was, and people did have a lot of fun playing the game, um, there were some flaws that he actually did take care of. And I'm going to take you guys through that process today, just to hopefully make this guy a little bit happier the next time he plays the game. So my name is Richard. Uh, I'm the studio animation director at Gorilla. I've been with the studio since 2007, so I've been there for 15 years now. As part of the original team that actually started Horizon Zero Dawn, and it's been a good seven to eight years as the creature lead, uh, creature animator lead, before taking on the role of director, so like halfway through our production of uh, Stitcher Things. So today I'm going to cover a little bit of the animation process on the latest Horizon game. It came out on February 18th, and it was called Horizon Forbidden West. Uh, we knew there was a lot more that we wanted to do with the IP, and we started on Forbidden West right after we finished the DLC, The Frozen Wilds. We kind of took, took a step back, um, sort of like to identify what our main goals for this project were going to be, and we went through a lot of feedback, and we searched basically from the feedback from all the players as well as the reviewers, but we always kept in mind what we wanted to do with the game as well. So the biggest focus for the animation team was going to the following areas. We really wanted to open up the world with new and exciting traversal mechanics. The melee combat needed to have a complete overhaul to be on the same quality as the ranged combat. And combat against human enemies needed a lot more depth to actually preserve from the team. And to make sure that machines still felt fresh, we needed a lot of variety and diversity this time compared to the Horizon Zero Dawn machines. Now, of course, there were a lot more mechanics and features that we needed to support, but these goals were beyond with this time and investment from the team. So unfortunately, I won't be able to cover the machines today due to time limitations, but feel free to grab them basically after the presentation and ask any questions you have about them. If you do want to know about the development process, you can watch the presentation on YouTube for free, and it's called Bringing Life to the Machines of Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, before we dive in, I would like to do a little bit of a quick introduction on who Aloy is for those of you who don't know her, but uh, it's both from a physicality and a personality point of view. And it might seem obvious, but it's important to just like clarify and understand uh, her character traits, and uh, a lot of her decision making actually comes from this. <coughs> and it's also something that I'm going to keep referring back to during the presentation. And it's also one of the reasons why some of the feedback that we actually got was pretty accurate. Because in those mechanics, we kind of dismissed her character in those cases. So we have this animation guide internally that describes describe all of the features, the do's and don'ts, how to pose her, etc. So let's take a quick overview. Now, Aloy has been an outcast for many years, and she will basically just disobey everybody and into prison if she believes it's right. Uh, this is basically her world, and she grew up loving him. And she'll basically do anything to protect him. Um, she's very determined to survive the game through the lens of the machines, which made her very resourceful over time. Uh, and then when the situation gets tough, she adapts quickly and busts on her own instincts. Now, because of her natural curiosity, she has spent a lot of time figuring out the physiology of her enemies. And with the lack of resources in her world, energy is a very valuable cost, uh, which has made her highly efficient. Uh, she's very tough and not really afraid to actually get her hands dirty or get hurt in the, in the process. Now, from a physicality point of view, she's got to be very agile and nimble, which has made her posture very upwards and energetic. A lot of her journeys and exploration have been either on foot or climbing or swimming, for example, which has given the muscularity of her gymnast, 
but a lot of excellent endurance. Now the world of horizons never really flat or easy to traverse, so she became pretty comfortable with difficult terrain. And uh, she's basically been hunting and fighting these machines since she was little. So she got used to these hats, like she actually had gotten a high, pretty high proficiency by probably because of this. Now we have all these mood board videos attached to our animation guide, and these are basically there to always refer back to and kind of like show the details that we're looking for. So you can see the little micro adjustments for balance in this case, or like how human muscles actually shake on physical tense moments, or how the muscles kind of contract and relax, and how they affect the posture and emotion. And those are so like all the extra layers that we're looking for in animation to kind of put on top of it. Now her way of traversing the world is very much inspired by traditional rock climbing, which she's been doing since a very young age. She's not a superhero, and things don't always go perfect for her. So she can basically miscalculate and harm and estimate and she can slip or fail. Now from a physical point of view, her legs are literally like the strongest acid. And even though she does have great endurance, she will get tired eventually. And exploration can be physically tense and exhausting, which we always want to show through her um, facial expressions and facial animations. Now there should be a sense of comfort in the ground traversal, and a key aspect to making it feel comfortable is to maintain her flow and keep the momentum going at all times. Her agility makes it very easy to go from free running into combat very quickly and almost effortless. Now, one thing actually that she doesn't do is backflips uh, or acrobatics. Like I said, like since everything is focused on efficiency for her, there's not really a reason to waste those valuable calories. Um, and because of that, we always have to take into account the loss of fitness as well. Now, this video right here was sort of like our prime example of how we wanted that flow momentum to feel. And the way he moves tells us so much about the feel. Like he's making these conscious decisions throughout the obstacles, and you can tell he has a lot of experience doing this. And a nice perfect moment he gives us right here, where he literally skips two platforms up towards the main track and then keeps on running the entire direction. Now, when it comes to combat, agility is basically a of the tool of aggression. That is not always the case. <laughs> She's basically physically weaker than most enemies, um, and that basically makes her to be smart about it, so she tends to be reliant. Emily, for us, really needs to feel painful and raw for every hit that she has to be dealt. And like I said, since Aoi is not really a superhero, uh, we need to show some of her imperfections, which will make her probably a lot more relatable. And just like the traversal of the videos, this hit was kind of like the perfect example of what we wanted uh, the combat to look and feel like. Because this woman is physically weaker, but she's very smart and strong. And her movement is super aggressive and explosive and has pace to it. That's how it's basically what makes it feel raw as well. Also, the flow doesn't really go perfect, but that's kind of like fine because that's the way it makes it feel super real. So now that we have a better understanding of who Ava is and her personality and her physicality, let's start with some of the new traversal mechanics that are curated for this game. So for traversal, we were mostly looking at new ways that she can basically explore the open world. And so the entire team went on a short period of everything goes, and a lot of quick and rough prototypes were created just to sort of like explore the possibilities. For me, this is always the funnest part of the project, uh, where we basically just throw spaghetti at the wall and just like see what sticks. Like I said, it's always a fun, the most fun and exciting thing because. kind of made that you could explore this giant open world and you could go anywhere and in some ways we really didn't deliver on that promise. Climbing was very restricted to handholds, mountains were really not accessible and swimming was very limited to surface swimming only. So if you think about it, like a lot of our gameplay was on a horizontal level. But for Forbidden West we really wanted to open, the, open up the world and bring in that verticality. And for that we needed some new abilities. So we were going to focus on dealing with heights and a way of descending down. Then getting up into the uh, getting up to high grounds faster. Underwater exploration, which was basically part of the core concept of Forbidden West, since half of it was a flooded area, and then climbing up mountains without handles. 
Now I want to focus on descending and the inclines today, since those had a lot of impact on the combat experience as well. And they also kind of need each other to get the most bang for your buck. Now if we, if we consider how we needed to descend in Zero Dawn, it wasn't really the most pleasant experience. It felt very clunky and it was really slow with basically the risk of falling to your death at every step. But now that we knew that we wanted the player to reach more heights, uh, we needed a way to actually descend quicker and avoid those long climb downs. Since everything was still on the table at this point, uh, our animation team usually starts with some quick previous animations just to get the conversation going within the teams. And what better way than to start up with a cool wing? Now we knew there were some elements here that could work, uh, but we also knew that if we presented it like this to the entire company, it would instantly get shut down. So, uh, <coughs> so we had to get a quick prototype just to get a feeling for how it looked and felt in game. And once we saw this, I mean, again, it still looks cool, but it starts to drift away from Aloy a little bit too much. And also, like the overview was getting lost with the amount of speed that we actually got in this case. So did we, when we did present this to the game director, like his feedback was basically that this felt too much like flying, and we really wanted to preserve that for when you're able to hack the Sunwing and you could actually fly in a mount this time around. So we really started to shift the focus to what he kept calling as a controlled descent, uh, and that was basically his keywords. So we had to gather these quick prototypes with the balloon traps that we actually had in game, where it was all about verticality and less about horizontal movement. This was way more in line with what the director wanted, and we stuck with two versions. So one that was basically like a linear set speed going down, and one where we could actually control the speed by slowing down in air. Now both versions were feeling a lot better to us, and we're still like heading in the right direction, as, at least as far as the functionality goes. So we did some play sessions with uh, the teams, and so like tried to see what the feedback for preferences were between these two. Now as that was going on, uh, one of our designers was actually playing around with the idea of linking some mechanics together, and he was trying out so like transitions to other annotations like the zip line over here. But also in combat, where you could actually take down a machine from the sky using your range weapon or the contextual takedowns. And once we saw this, like everybody just went nuts and it was like, oh shit, like this is so cool. We would basically should need to start doing this, and it really started to show the potential not just for the mechanic in traversal, but also adding a lot of possibilities in combat and combat. And we thought we basically would get, end up with some really cool moments, and that was when we decided to fully embrace this and really start actively searching for connecting new mechanics together. And this is also where the previous slowdown speed up that we had was becoming a little bit too conflicting because it required way too much input and it lost all the fluidity in the combat at that point. So for animation, we started with looking into something with a lot of physicality and the exaggerated motions just to show like how much force is being pushed on our body. So you can think of skydivers, for example, when they open up their parachute and all those forces kick in when the velocity breaks starts kicking in. But when we put this in game, it all felt a little bit too much, like especially when you would blend out at the first part of this um, animation, because Ava is almost on a horizontal plane at that point. And if we wanted to use this in combat, we knew players needed to be able to use this in shorter bursts. So we toned it down a little bit and we started focusing on keeping Aloy a lot more vertical just to have smoother blends in this case. And of course we still wanted to show the proper force and the push, push sense of action during the deployment, but only on a vertical axis. And we also decided just to go with different starts depending on which height you're in. Uh, since we have a little bit more time on higher altitudes, but less time when we're close to the ground, uh, that way we could just show the different uh, situation, different uh, physicality. Now one thing we always make sure of is to open up the deployment pose from the back view and have that clear silhouette for any case. So we basically always show that she is actively opening up the shield from the side and making her feel in control. And for the visual look, we basically just dropped the balloon trap that you saw and we went for a version with the shell walker force shield. It gave a lot more direction basically to the mechanics since we could actually show steering, but it also felt a little bit more resourceful uh, from, crafting, from, from the crafting ends, like being more connected to the machines. So now that we had that tool that can basically help us get down faster and potentially be used in combat, let's take a look at how we can actually get into the air faster. Now the way that would work in Zero Dawn was basically just keep on jumping or be lucky that there were handholds to climb up on. And keeping it like that would stall the mechanic way too much and it would just completely break the throw. So we needed to have something that could basically get us in the air quick and fast and make sure that it actually complements the fluidity we were after in the traversal and in the combat. Now one of the things that we were prototyping in this stage as well was to make a puzzle tool out of the rope caster weapon. 
We were basically testing if we could use the weapon to open up spaces or create new pathways for alien cauldrons, for example. Some designers were actually looking if they could use the rope tool for climbing, but their first vision was um, basically focusing to use it as an addition to climbing and making it super slow. You can basically think of like a SWAT member walking on the side of a building or something like that. And we thought like if we wanted to use this in both traversal and in combat, it needed to be a lot more faster and, uh, and agile. But the game director was really afraid that if we would put in a fast grapple tool, it would become too superhero-like. So again, like we take some time just to sell our idea with another previous, but we took it a little bit further than usually just to see if we can take his doubts away. Now the challenge here was to make it distinct and so like grounded in Halo's personality. So we took the direction of actually making it look like things are not always going perfectly smooth for her. She kind of struggles and some of these inclines and gravity and velocity can actually get the best of her, but she can recover and so like use her agility to her advantage. And this time around, it was also the actual the first time that we played around with gaining more verticality by pushing the upwards momentum and getting that air time in there. And that was super well received and so like in the end it turned out to be the biggest advantage of the whole mechanic. So when we start, start to first implement it, um, we did it in a very traditional way, consisting of starts, loops, and stops. And we knew it needed to be flexible because we weren't really sure on any measurements yet. And we figured this was probably the easiest way to go. But you can kind of see that the, like the, some of the fluidity is getting lost that we were looking for. I mean, the mechanic itself works, but we could all, we could, at least from our point of view, we could see and feel where the transitions were, which is something that we did, really didn't want in this case. So. Um, we could have tried to make it as smooth as possible, but in the end we figured it would just be easier if we just use a couple of single animations. So we used the metrics that would work the best for the majority of the combat scenarios. So we would either have a 10, 5 or 0 meters on a horizontal plane and a 5 or 10 meter increase in vertical axis. And with that we could basically cover the entire grid with only 14 single animations. So for example, when we have a five meter distance, you can actually see that Ayla is able to catch the velocity towards the wall with her legs. But when we do a 10 meter distance, she will basically crash into the wall before recovering again. And then for the lesser height increases, we focus a lot more on the fluidity and the, and the agility, since those would be the ones that would be used in the combat scenarios the most. Now we also have a system in place that adjusts the framing and orientation if the player doesn't uh, control, like touch the camera. So with magnets we kind of align the camera to show the ideal readability to the target. And then we frame the animation in such a way where we see the key pose exactly how we want it for clarity in the line of action. It's not a lock thing, so the player can always decide to move the camera at any time they want, but it gave us some handles to at least figure it in some position in such a way where we can show it to the player with the way we want it. Now, of course, you only know if these mechanics actually work together if you give it to Sunny Legend and he makes a gif out of it. And it was crazy just to see how we got the mechanics instantly without explaining any of this that I just told you. And as you can see, the focus is a lot on the fluidity and the mechanics and the way Aloy moves. And we really wanted to have that high production quality in there, but at the same time, that it really adds to the joy of the player and feeling control of Aloy basically when she's in these combat scenarios. Now with the added verticality in game, there was a lot more chance for the player to basically end up getting really, really close to the enemy, and especially in, like in the combat encounters. So we needed to look into upgrading the melee system as well. Now if you've played Zero Dawn, um, you know melee wasn't really that great. Just like the dude said as well. I mean, it was written about in most major reviews, and it always came back as feedback to us. And the summary was always range and stealth is awesome, but melee just sucks. So there wasn't a lot of depth to it, and all the focus during the production for Zero Dawn basically went to do range and stealth combat, since that was the core combat loop of the game. But now that we were heading a little bit more towards these abilities and linking mechanics together, it was time for a complete overhaul of the melee system. And as usual, we start out with a nice simple previous animation just to capture all our ideas and so like communicate that with game direction. So here you can see that we use this verticality by bringing multiple level of heights. And then we really started focusing on the fluidity of the player, so she can switch between range and close combat and vice versa. And one thing that we wanted to introduce this time around is that NPCs can actually grab me now as well, just to show that Aloy is human, and then we actually introduce that risk versus reward for the player as well. Now overall it was pretty well received, um, but we wanted to take a little bit more time just to flesh it out. 
So here we actually show, introduce an NPC leader and like handing out orders. And we look into possibly having an archer class that could actually move while shooting just to introduce a lot more agility and challenge to the player. And then NPCs could actually use coordination and the environment to their advantage. Where Aloy could actually use launches or parrying or basically switch between light attacks or takedowns or the ranged attacks. And one thing that we wanted to look as well is that we could jump on or off enemies just to sort of like further explore the difference between ranged and close combat. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the progress we actually went through for the combat. The first thing that we actually needed to do were two things just to improve the overall feel for Malik. An example that you see here in Zero Dawn that really broke the system was that the player could end up occupying the same space as the enemy because of the forward momentum that DHG actually had. And this caused them to end up in the same spot like you see here. So we really needed to come up with a way where we could keep the player from moving inside the minimum bounds around the enemy but without locking them to each other. And next to that, we also really needed to fix the player assistance. Uh, here's another example from Zero Dawn where we had to compensate with a lot of warping sometimes. And uh, we really wanted to make sure that this time there was a minimum amount of translation assistance and that the player is always in control over their positioning. And that is sort of like where the correlation between forward motion and the hit reaction for the NPCs come into play. And the way we actually do that is that we try to keep the attack distance as much animation driven as possible. So the enemy translates the correct distance away from Aloy when hit just to preserve that ideal combat distance uh, between the two. Now, of course, that basically goes both ways. So the base the same goes actually for Aloy when she's being hit. And here's a little bit of a slower breakdown. So basically the staggered hit translation of the NPC is the exact same distance as the follow-up attack of Aloy. And then working with those metrics gave us the most predictive result to make sure that at least warping was kept to a minimum after the first hit for Aloy. Now as for the combos themselves, they needed to be pretty predictable and repeatable for the player, so nothing super complex. And we kind of kept it simple and we stuck with the same two button inputs that we had on Zero Dawn as well. And to fit with the direction we took from combining mechanics, the new combos needed to have that same fluidity and response that we saw in the, in the exploration. And next that we also had uh, to make sure that it was a reflection of who Aloy was. So very skilled with a lot of physicality and a lot of proper weight in there. So we started out with this light combo string that we really wanted to build the entire system on. And for game design, the attacks needed to be a lot faster this time around. So in Zero Dawn, we deliberately slowed down the attacks just to discourage the player from overusing Mali. But this time, they needed to be a lot more responsive just to get the most out of the mechanic. And we mostly focused on keeping the forward momentum going and basically just keep it working from running and walking, uh, as well as making all the transitions to be able to do it from sliding and jumping. After this first uh, like implementation, for me, like from an animation direction point of view, it all felt way too fast. And we were really losing the weight and the grounded feeling that Aloy has. And especially the readability was becoming a huge problem. Uh, because to me, like, it just felt like I was just registering quick anticipations and some settle poses, but everything in between just became muddy. So we really needed to start to slow things down. And that wasn't really well received by the sign. They were so like afraid that we started to lose the intensity and the responsiveness that they were looking for. And they were just convinced that it was just a lack of polish and clarity would, be, would come in whenever things were finalized. And uh, we kind of already knew that that was not going to be the case. And we got into a bunch of pretty heated arguments going back and forth. But just to get the breakthrough that we were looking for, we just tested it out only on the first string just to see the results. And that way we could sort of like avoid having to redo everything if it turns out that polish wasn't really the answer that they were hoping for. So our lead animator polished the first combo and got it to more or less like a shippable quality. And at the same time, he also made these two different versions that were 10% or 20% slower. As you can see, the weight so like starts to increase and the readability becomes a lot more clear the slower we go. And for, for me, like my first initial reaction was that the moves at 20% slower we're kind of like exactly where I wanted things to end up, but we needed to test this on the NPCs as well. So here for me it was the exact same conclusion, like the weight and the impact and the, just the overall readability of the moves just start to feel a lot nicer the slower the version goes. Um, and after all the teams like started to play around with the different speeds for a couple of days, the conclusion was unfortunately that the 20% was a little bit too slow. Uh, the combo started to feel sluggish and the button press rhythms and the overall challenge was just started to drift away from hitting the timing of the combos just right. 
So we dialed it back again and we made a 15% version and a 12% version slower. And then 12% was exactly in a sweet spot where both the designers were happy with and animation was happy with. And that's basically what we shipped with in the end. Again, don't get me wrong, like I would still love to ship with a 20% slower version, but I mean, if it kills gameplay, then we're doing a bad job as well, right? Now, in addition to those light attacks, we also have two heavy attacks in game. And since we have a little bit more time here, we could basically just show Aloy's skill with the spear and the anticipation by doing little spear tosses or change up the patterns. And for the regular charge attack, this is, or like for the charge attack, this time we actually show her flipping sideways. It's still not a full card wheel. And since she only does it once here, uh, we felt this was more or less acceptable. And we really used it just to get that nice big anticipation pose and delay in the spear so we could maximize the power of impact. Now these heavy attacks cause a larger stagger already on the NPC and introduce the possibility for the player to follow up with a ranged attack. Um, but because of the long anticipation here, the risk versus reward is still pretty high for the player. And that's where the next mechanic would basically come into play. So now that we have some options where we can get into close range by either doing a light combo or a single heavy attack, and if we take into account the shield wing and the pull caster, we introduce the approach from above, right? But we're still missing the ability to quickly switch between melee and the range with the fluidity and response that we were looking for. And that's where the jump offs come into play to cover larger horizontal distances. But we weren't really sure how to make this look and work. Uh, we already saw basically in the previous uh, where Aloy was standing on top of the NPC's chest for a while, but that was more of a, a, like a, a mechanic for displacing a trap or a device. And, uh, we kind of dismissed that since we all felt it was a little bit too far-fetched for a grown woman to be standing on top of a person's chest for that long. <laughs> but we had a similar takedown in Zero Dawn, and this was always one of those scenarios that could deal either way for me. On one hand, I felt it was acceptable, but on the other hand, I always felt it was a little bit too far from the laws of physics that we actually established in the game. So it was going to be a very thin line just to get the whole thing right, but looking at this, we somehow accepted it and got away with it, right? So we tried some small tests just to see how long the actual uh, combat, uh, contact moment needed to last and what kind of distance we could cover before pushing it too far. Now as long as the contact moment was short and the posing was so, like, very physical while maintaining that fluidity, it actually worked surprisingly well to us. So we could either get in the air now with a single tap and so, like, use your ranged weapon from a verticality again, but it won't get you that horizontal distance yet. But now with a double tap in there, you can actually get the long distance jump just to get into that ideal range combat pocket and start switching up your strategies as a player. Now this added a lot more play freedom and choice to the movie system overall. On some of our combos, the hardest part was basically just to figure out like how we had to deal with the spear and not make it look repetitive all the time. So it gave us a lot of nice opportunities just to get some creative solutions in there. Just wanted to make sure that uh, the flow felt fluid while maintaining that momentum. We used a bunch of tricks by doing hand pass overs during the animations. And the slow down version, you can actually see that we're tossing the spear just to make sure she can actually strike without doing another full 360 spin. And thus maintaining the rhythm and not making it feel super awkward because of it. And another example that we needed uh, was that we needed to avoid so like seeing the spear going in the same motion the entire time. And because of this, we sometimes had to use some hold moments in the animation uh, of the spear just to stop the pattern and get a better read on it for the player. So we basically keep the body momentum going in this case for the speed and the fluidity, but we use another spear that's with a lot more hang time for the readability and making sure that the follow-up anticipation feels really big and powerful. And then we basically just end with a nice so like spear toss behind her back in the saddle for like that nice attitude and so like showing how skilled she actually is with this weapon. But it also again like brings clarity to the player so you don't put it in front of the body and they don't really see the switch happening, but it's always behind the back facing the camera. And again for the camera system we kind of like use the same uh, similar setup that we did with the uh, rope caster. Uh, so when alien NPCs are literally like in line in front of each other, we still like automatically orient the, the camera. Uh, to the side view, giving a little bit more clarity and framing the action. Uh, now, as with all our so like, automatic reorientations, this will only take place if the player is not actively controlling the camera, but it did give us another way to present the exact action exactly how we wanted it to look. Now, lastly, for combat, like for the takedowns, we learned uh, some lessons basically previously that we applied for Forbidden West from the start this time around. And here you can sort of like, see a takedown that we uh, blocked in for Horizon Zero Dawn. And this one never really felt right to us. Uh, and we like, realized what it was when we started to break it down 
afterwards, and Ayla is not really doing anything here. Everything so like happens by accident for her, right? The scrapper is actually the one attacking and taking the initiative in this case, and Ayla just happens to put her spear up in the exact right time to strike him right there. So one of our rules that we have now in takedowns is that Ayla is always the one initiating the attack and basically being in charge of the action at all times. And here's a similar one that we ended up with in Forbidden West. And as you can see, Ava is fully in charge, and at the same time, we show her skill and agility. And one thing I actually want to point out as well that's very important to us is that for enemies, we always wanted them to be aware for believability and to show a little bit of character. It's basically just like any of us. Like, if we hear or see something coming, we instantly react on it, right? And it feels really out of place if they don't. So just a small moment of acknowledgement is just enough to make them feel like actual believable characters. Now again, if we string all this together and we make use of the traversal and verticality combined with the melee and ranged, you can really start seeing how much variety the player has available to it. And it really makes for some exciting and dynamic combat scenarios, as you can see here, captured again by the amazing Sunny Legends. Now with Ailey having a lot more combat abilities and depth, the uh, human enemies needed to get the same treatment to keep up with the same level of detail. And looking back at Zero Dawn, it was kind of the same overall tone that we saw with Malid. The machines are super awesome at throwing to encounter, but NPCs are just uninteresting with bad AI and are basically there just for headshot practice. So we kind of like summarized some of the key issues to ourselves. At first there was a lack of depth and they appeared very basic, especially compared to some of the combat machines. Uh, we also had a lack of variety since we only had one single, single archetype in the game. There were a lot of readability issues, uh, both from a physical point of view, visual point of view as well as hard to read anticipations in patterns and in the attacks. And overall, it's like the, they behaved very unrealistic uh, and not very actively, like acting properly in groups with a lot of bad speech and AI. So they felt more like exploits to the players and a bit of a burden to get through with a lot of repetitive gameplay. So we looked into a couple of categories just to add some depth to the NPCs uh, where we wanted it. So we really wanted to have a lot more variety instead of just that one single class. The hit response system needed to have a complete overhaul. And then the focus would really uh, have, have to rely on adding that personality and the characteristics in them. And then we overall wanted to have that combat experience to have the same so like feel and be on the next level that you have against the machine uh, when you're fighting them. Now when we look at back at Zero Dawn, the game only had one archetype of human NPC. So to make up for that lack of variety, uh, the idea was just to create a roster of classes with their own unique features and challenges. And to make this recognizable, we would stick with the typical game archetypes that are very familiar in games, uh, but with a little bit of a horizon twist. And this would basically help us define their roles versus the other classes when it comes to behavior or visuals, for example. So they're all designed around this clear combat, uh, clear gameplay function, which we could show through their actions and their postures and their locomotion. So we have a grunt, which is basically our least experienced enemy and is capable of using both melee and ranged weapons. And they're more of the supporting roles to the higher classes. Then we have a knight, who is very swift and efficient and has a shield for protection. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, then we have the uh, right, right, right. Right here. Sorry. Then we have the marksman, who is very agile and is very precise from the shooting range. Then we have the heavy melee, which is very slow, but it's all about high melee damage output. While the heavy range itself is all about the high range uh, damage output. And then we finally have the riders, which are the grunts, basically on mounted machines. And this was mostly requested from a story point of view, uh, since Ayla would actually encounter tribes this time around that are capable of overriding machines as well. Now to make that roster work, we had to put some restrictions on the characters to, just to make it work for animation. The cost of animation said we're gonna be super high, we had to make everything unique, both from a financial point of view, as well as from a game memory point of view and performance. Now the reason we couldn't make everything unique is because we wanted to make sure that there's a lot of variety this time around, which would take an immense amount of time and effort to win. In Zero Dawn we were spread very thinly uh, in the animations per state that we had, so things started to look repetitive, like you could hear the dude saying it at the start. But the NPCs may, uh, basically needed to feel as grounded as the players, so we needed a lot more variety this time around. And we wanted to be smart about our approach and our rig choices. So we settled on going with two rig variations uh, that could handle a wide variety of classes. So we have a rig for generic body types, 
And this could cover everything from very malnourished to the more generic muscular bodies and Chris Pratt as well. <laughs> and our second rig would support the heavy body types. And this could basically handle everything from very muscular to almost overweight. Although the dude on the left is pretty overweight. So sticking with only two rigs would give us the opportunity to add a lot of variety, right? And both in the animation stage, so we could support as well as the body types that it could actually handle. And even when all the armor would be stripped, we could still have that readability on both those classes. And to get the most variation out of the two rigs, we went with dressing them up by adding all these different types of elements to them. That would basically just create a nice secondary motion, for instance, in the cloth or in the hair or the feathers, in the weapons and in the armor. And this allowed for even more variety within that same archetype. So now that we actually have settled on so like what direction we wanted to go for, for the visual look, let's dive into some of the animations from starting with the hit responses. Now again, if you look at the Zero Dawn example, the reactions are kind of underwhelming. The whole readability and the impacts are pretty small and there is a lot of lack of personality in there. The overall motion to me basically just reads a lot more like a ragdoll instead of a human being actually getting shot, right? So we used the same system that we actually used for the machines where we divided the classes into four different hit zones to get unique outcomes. So the head basically triggers a stagger backwards. The chest and the arms so like cause a stagger that turns around facing the player with the, to, to the back. Then if you shoot them in the back, they would cause a full forward knockdown. And the legs that would actually cause a stumble. And that way we could actually get specific outcomes with specific windows of opportunities for the players. And we knew this would only work if we added enough variations uh, to pick and randomize from. Like I mentioned before, one of the reasons Zero Dawn wasn't really working was because we were super spread thin in the animation, as well as having that very underwhelming acting and animation in there. And um, because of that, we recorded a lot of hit responses this time around. And here you can kind of see the first implementation without the actual polish. And for the animation direction, we kind of grab back to our old kills on two concept of every bullet has a dramatic impact. And that meant for us that we made them respond properly and match that force of impact. So a medium hits will show a medium impact and bigger hits will show larger impacts. And as you can see, we really focus on believability and personality in these reactions, making lots of like big exaggerated moves with sometimes over the top dramatic acting when they fall down and it really pushes that sense of character to them. And by adding plenty of variations this time around, the enemies would not fall into the repetition of showing the same hit response over and over again. Right? So we made sure that we actually captured a lot of these. And I think we have about 150 to 200 unique deaths in game and probably double or triple that amount of staggers for the NPCs. Now when we actually went into animating the different archetypes, our biggest focus would lie on actually adding that believability and personality there. And to make sure that the behaviors are very distinguished from each other within the classes, we make what we call character decks. And these kind of like describe the personality and the behavior and the characteristics in both idle and in combat situations and are basically there only for the animators. It's just like with Ava's animation guide that we started with. This would help us just to make choices about posing or about locomotion, but also during the mocap sessions to direct the actors. This would really help get us uh, consistency in there when shooting multiple actions or multiple actors during multiple sessions. So let's take a look at what we did for the grunt. And from a personality point of view, the grunts are the least experienced bandits and we really wanted them to be pretty rowdy and rough and unrestrained because of that. They basically have the least amount of uh, actual combat experience, so they can still be pretty versatile and a little bit more all-around, all unlike some of the other specialized classes that we have. Now to describe a class with one single keyword, the team went with an approach of searching for a kindred spirit or a spirit animal. And we tried to match an animal counterpart with attitudes that are very similar to the archetype. And that really brought a nice, fresh perspective and angle of approach for us. And based on that, we could make decisions about the behavior or the attacks and the overall feel of the animation. So for the grunt, we actually picked the hyena as a kindred spirit. And if we break it down, that meant to us that they're very aggressive in large groups, but they can, keep, can be kind of hesitant in smaller numbers. And they tend to be naturally drawn to a superior or an alpha, and they have the urge to kind of like hide behind the more experienced classes in the, when they're in the area. We could all show that through the gestures, the AI, AI and the behavior. Now to match the hyena posture and feel that we wanted to capture, we looked into this more hunched over and grounded poses where the head is low, shoulders are up, very grounded, nice uh, widespread in the legs. And then for our own exercise, we did a small summary of how they would uh, so like react and behave in different situations. So when they're alerted and they investigate, they either act very unthorough 
or they just call in reinforcements since they're kind of hesitant by themselves, right? And then when projectiles are being hit near them, they either flinch or they instantly start looking around just to see if a superior got hit. They're very much the helping hand in combat situations, but that's mostly out of selfishness because they really don't want to end up fighting alone. And then in terms of their gestures, they mostly just use big pointing gestures and they shout a lot just to make them feel more important than they actually are. Again, this wasn't really per se how things would end up, but it gave us some nice great handholds in the direction that we wanted to take. So when a grunt actually goes into combat, it can all look a little bit uncontrolled and ungraceful due to his lack of experience. But at the same time, he is very comfortable with his weapon and he has a good understanding of the balance and the feel of it, since that's the only thing that he knows how to handle his practice at this stage. Now all of that was kind of like taking into account when we went into the mocap sessions. And the stunt actors we worked with were really, really pushing it and they really gave it their 120% just to show that rowdiness and that unconstrained, unconstrained uh, locomotion. And you can see that they're kind of like losing their control and their balance and their stances and in the sometimes, which really amplified the lack of experience in combat and portrayed that animalistic behavior that we were looking for. Now for clarity and readability of the attacks, we use the same technique that we use on the machines, uh, where we really focus on just a couple of key elements, like a couple of key elements in the animation. This is the majority of our combat is like happening in this frontal view. Uh, we always wanted to make sure that the readability, there's clear anticipation in the attack follow through are really clear from this perspective. Now you can see the raw data implemented on the left side and the final polished version on the right side. And if we break it down, it becomes quite clear what the difference is and what we focused on. So in the anticipation, the acts need to stay clear and readable, which was less visible in the raw version. Then in the airtime, the axe actually disappears in the raw data, where we really wanted to make sure it was fully on display, uh, visible for the player. Now, of course, we want to have that nice, clear push line of action and the posing for better readability. But then during the attack moment of the swing, you can see the messy line of action in the raw version, where we clean it up uh, on the right side, where it has a very distinct, client, clear line of action from screen left to, lo to lower screen right. And that is one of our key components in our attack approach. We always pick one clear line of action on screen, and that's what makes stand out. And that really helps to make everything read uh, when things are becoming pretty chaotic in a combat scenario. And then to emphasize the personality a lot more, we also have these little moments after an, like, of attitude after a melee attack or wave response. So some of them show the cockiness, where others basically just show the way they deal with a miss by pointing and saying, okay, okay, I'll get you next time. Or basically just show how pissed off they are that they got beaten up, right? And it's really brought a lot of life into the characters when we saw these moments playing out uh, during combat. Now for the last part of the variation, within the same class, we also implement different base poses for the eye animation depending on the strength of the level of the grunt. So tier one on the left, um, you can see he's a little bit more uncomfortable, he's very high in his breath and energy and almost like anxious to actually get into battle. Right tier two in the middle would stay very, it's, it's still high in energy, but it's starting to get a little bit more grounded and hunched over and so like less fast paced in his breath. But then the one on screen, at least the tier three on screen, right, is the one that basically just feels the most experienced, focused and danger, right? And he's very grounded, nice high shoulders, low tilt in the head with a steady stare, making him feel the most danger out of all three of them. So all these elements combined will just add a little bit more of the lifeliness and the diverse experience to the NPCs. And so like next time, whenever you have a chance to play the game, just take a moment if you can actually spot any of these personalities shine through their actions. So to have a little bit of a summary, uh, by identifying some of the underdeveloped mechanics in Zero Dawn, we were able to make a much more complex experience this time in Forbidden West. We really tried to open up that world as much as, much as possible to the player, and in doing so, we actually found some nice, great combat experiences and mechanics along the way. And that really made us embrace the idea of like, combining combat and traversal with a heavy focus on response, flow, and fluidity for that high quality and that fun experience that the player needs to have. At the same time, we added a lot of personality to Aloy, the human enemies, and so like the machines. And that created a lot more depth and believability to the characters and overall so like enhanced that immersion and the encounters. And on top of that, adding a lot more variety will just keep things fresh for the player and make it feel like you're a part of this giant, living, like giant living, breathing open world. So thank you for all for listening. Um,